back on the Zero Hour. I am your host, as always, Richard R.J. Escal. As we continue our coverage of uh, drug reform battles in Washington, D.C., the Build Back Better Act and more, uh, we now welcome to the program David Mitchell. David Mitchell is the founder of an organization called Patients for Affordable Drugs Now, also acronymed as a summarized as PA4D now, Patients for Affordable Drugs Now, and uh, he is an advocate for drug pricing uh, reform. And as we will discuss, David also has an incurable form of cancer, which makes the issue especially permanent, uh, especially pertinent, I should say, to him, and uh, as we'll talk about to me as well, but also to millions of Americans, young and old. Uh, so without any uh, further ado, David Mitchell, welcome to the Zero Hour. Richard, thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, uh, a pleasure. And uh, let's start with this. What got you involved in uh, drug reform advocacy? So as you mentioned, I have uh, multiple myeloma. It's an incurable blood cancer. It's incurable, but it's treatable for some unknown period of time with very expensive drugs. I was actually diagnosed 11 years ago today. Uh, and right mm -hmm. now, my uh, doctors have me on a four drug combination, uh, four different chemo drugs that carry a list price of more than $900,000 a year. Now, I'm very grateful for these drugs. They are literally keeping me alive because I have active multiple myeloma. Uh, and uh, I need these drugs right now, but I will fail on these drugs at some point. The reason it's incurable is, is because nothing works forever. So I care deeply about innovation and new drug development where I'm going to die sooner than I hope to. Uh, but... My journey as a cancer patient taught me a simple truth, and that is drugs don't work if people can't afford them. Right. And right now we have a situation in this country where uh, drug companies are able to dictate the prices of brand name drugs to the American people. As a result, we pay almost four times what people in other nations pay for the exact same brand drugs. Uh, we want to restore balance to ensure that we both get the innovation we need for the future, but at prices we can afford. And uh, I bit this one off because it was so frustrating to see that there were no patient groups speaking out about drug pricing. The reason they don't is because they all take money from the drug companies. Right. Uh, and so uh, we, my wife and I said, well, let's try and you know, take this issue on. And uh, that's why I'm doing it. Uh, a, it's personal. B, uh, someone needed to try. <laughs> and uh, here we are. You know, David Mitchell, I, uh, I I debated with myself before this interview how much to talk about myself, but as we were briefly talking before this segment, uh, it's an issue of more than abstract concern to me. It's funny because I came at it from almost the opposite angle, which is I've been involved in healthcare reform, drug pricing reform, healthcare policy for many years, and then found myself in the sort of you know, getting closer to the high of the, eye of the hurricane. I have a condition I never heard of until I got it, but which you're familiar with, that they call uh, MGUS, monoclonal gammopathy of of undetermined, undefined significance, to which my response to the doctors is, if you don't know if it's significant, how should I know? But, <laughs> but, but it's a precursor. It's you know, it sometimes leads to. Uh, multiple myeloma, the cancer that you have, it, uh, in my case, leaves me immunocompromised, so I get infusions every month to take care of it, and I also have um, uh, a chronic lung condition uh, that I have to take a biologic medications for, and as you know, as a drug activist, biologic uh, medications are also very expensive. 
so uh, I think I figured out, I, I, I at one point I actually felt guilty, Dave, and I wanted to talk to you about this. I kind of totaled up the list prices of my medications, and I'm not in your category, uh, uh, but uh, it was about 150000 a year. And, you know, 100, 150000 here, 150000 there, pretty soon you're talking about real money, as John Paul Getty would say. And, and uh, I start to feel bad. And then I realize, you know, like, oh, boy, I'm costing the people of the United States so much. And then I realize, oh, wait a minute. I'm not costing them. You're not costing them. The drug companies are costing them. I mean, that's a fair reaction. I don't think we should feel badly because we need uh, pharmaceutical support uh, to stay alive as long as we can. Should we? No, we shouldn't feel guilty. And by the way, I want to apologize for chuckling about you defining MGUS. Uh, it, it, myeloma kills people. It's a serious cancer. It's the second most prevalent blood cancer, and I did not in any way... Uh, no, 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 no. I, I think uh, it's funny, too. I was being flippant. I apologize uh, for being flippant. I, I was yeah. chuckling at you uh, finding your way through the the MGUS words. Um, right. But, uh, no, this is not my doing. Uh, we don't know the etiology. We don't know the cause of multiple myeloma. I just you know, got dealt a bad card. Right. Uh, and yet I need these drugs to, to stay alive. And even though I may not pay for that full $900,000, I will say that one of my oral drugs, uh, chemo drugs under Medicare Part D, cost me more than $15,000 a year out of pocket. <laughs> but someone is paying the price of those drugs. Right. It's right. your employer or it's the government or it's you because you're getting less money in your paycheck because your employer uh, can't afford to pay the full price so they shift some of the cost on to you. And this is one of the insidious features, I don't often talk about this, of our drug pricing system. And that is you can only spend a dollar once. If we had unlimited resources, we could pay whatever the drug companies want. Let them charge whatever they want. Who cares? We don't. We have other needs in our country. Right. You know, we need to provide people with um, health care in hospitals, with good nutrition, with right. good education for their kids. And every dollar of unwarranted profits that we send to the drug companies out of that nine hundred thousand dollars price of my drugs is a dollar we don't have for other things we need to do as a society. Pharma is siphoning off money that could be used to help make lives better, health better, education better, streets safer. And that is one of the things that's most infuriating to me because it's that often addressed. And you know, another dimension of this, David Mitchell, uh, that, I, uh, that I think about often is um that and i've looked into this and i'm sure you have too and i've written about it a little bit uh is that in so many cases the drugs that we're being outrageously overcharged for as a society as well as as individual patients are often developed at public expense with public resources with the people's resources so we go i wrote a piece about a zika potential zika vaccine the United States government was spending 100% of the development costs of that vaccine, then turning it over to a French pharmaceutical company that had it panned out, would have charged whatever the hell they want. It's like if I build a house and give it to you, and then you charge me a million dollars rent every year to live in the house that I built and paid for. This is what we deal with, with a profoundly corrupt system of drug companies in this country, don't you think? Uh, you are exactly right. Uh, it turns out that all of the 356 drugs approved by the FDA from 2010 to 2019 are based in some way on taxpayer funded research through the National Institutes of Health. Second, let's talk about the vaccines. Years ago, in uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago, Drug companies stopped spending money on vaccine research because it was too risky. Vaccines weren't profitable. So 
knowing that a pandemic was coming eventually, the National Institutes of Health and the Defense Department, uh, an organization called DARPA in the Defense Department, actually invested in research into mRNA vaccines. And as a result of that investment of hundreds of millions of dollars, when the pandemic hit in January of 2020, there was an mRNA technology that was ready for organizations like Pfizer and Moderna to run with. So we actually laid the foundation to save ourselves. The drug companies want to say, we saved you, we saved you. It's not true. We saved ourselves. They wouldn't invest back then. Second, it not only did we lay the foundation for the mRNA vaccines with pre-pandemic research that we paid for as taxpayers, but then we spent $22 billion more to stand up manufacturing capacity for Moderna that had never produced a drug, not one, to run their clinical trials and to do advanced purchase agreements for Pfizer and Moderna so that we de-risked the whole enterprise. And now, if you saw the reports this week, Pfizer is like reporting $39 billion in revenue. It used to be that a blockbuster drug was a billion dollars a year. Pfizer is getting $39 billion dollars in revenue uh, based on a vaccine, a medicine that we developed and helped bring to market. In fact, we still own patents in Moderna. Uh, they are taking some of that massive profit, cutting off what is a, a very small slice with a very big return, funneling it into lobbyists so that they're what? Now, two two drug company lobbyists for every member of Congress. Yes. Or some, so I guess one works a day shift, one works a night shift, I don't know. But round the clock, basically lobbying coverage. And that's how we get a system that, uh, I, I don't know another word for it. I would call it corrupt. Uh, amoral works. Amoral, uh, amoral works. And obviously okay. it's not illegal. I mean, we can't claim it's illegal because no lawmakers have legalized all this but, but, but let's talk about what it is that you have just raised but before we do that i also want to mention that as a result of our taxpayer investment we have minted nine new billionaires in the vaccine companies hmm. uh, um we uh help finance all of this their stock prices went up they own a bunch of stock nine new billionaires courtesy of American taxpayers in these vaccine companies. Well, just uh, what the world back, needed was nine new billionaires. Uh, back, to, back to your point, you know, um, we give drug companies monopolies to dictate prices to the American people uh, for brand drugs. And a monopoly by definition has unlimited resources. A monopoly, if it needs more money for campaign contributions or ads, to scare people or lie to people about legislation that would lower drug prices or for lobbyists, you just raise the price. Pharma does that. And they are one of the heaviest spenders. I think this year they are the heaviest spender for lobbying and that sort of activity, trying desperately to stop the legislation that is now moving through Congress that is going to help curb the prices of prescription drugs. Um, and they're willing to spend whatever it takes. They're willing to do whatever it takes. Uh, they are, in fact, if not corrupt, they certainly are amoral um, in, in terms of what they are willing to do to maintain their economic power over the people of our country. So you, I say corrupt, you say amoral. Let's compromise and say they're corrupt and amoral. Um, there. The, okay. there. the um, and and David Mitchell again, his organization. Let me make sure I get this uh, this name right. Patients for Affordable Drugs. Now, David, you mentioned uh, the legislation currently being debated in in Congress, and and, and we've certainly uh, seen this struggle time again, time and time again, where. 
uh, uh, legislation gets proposed. In this case, part of Build Back Better, but there was HR three, and there've been you know HR, maybe it was HR one previous year, and and, and uh, so drug uh, legislation gets proposed. It, it's going to take a bite out of drug costs. It gets pared way down, yeah. and then and then it goes away. And now we're in the uh, a point where my understanding is it's being debated as part of the Build Back Better no. package of provisions. And uh, um, I just want to keep reiterating this point. There was the outline of a possible agreement last Monday. Right. And, right? And, um, and that basically... Uh, as I understand it, and I've, I, I, I'm asking another guest about this too, but uh, will help people like you and me yes. if it's enacted. And, and again, it's not all about you and me, but just as a point of reference, if, for example, it will cap, my understanding was it would cap the out-of-pocket Medi uh, Medicare drug costs at something like $2,000 a year. Is that right? That is correct. And then there were other provisions in there as well, maybe... Uh, maybe you can tell us about oh, what some of the other provisions are in there. So th this bill is making its way through Congress. It has been agreed to what they call pre-conference uh, by 50 de Democrats in the House, I mean, in the Senate and a majority in the House. So it is a deal that has been cut. It's not everything, I have to be honest, that we sure. would have liked if we could write the legislation ourselves, but it is good. And it will help patients in this country, and it will help all Americans in these ways. Number one, it imposes an inflation rebate that if a drug company increases the price of its drug more than the rate of inflation, it has to pay a rebate, which will stop them from raising prices faster than the rate of inflation. That will apply not only to Medicare, but to private sector plans. So every American will benefit from effectively a cap on price increases at no greater than the rate of inflation. Because they've been price gouging us for years, they raise prices at will. Right. Second, um, it will impose a no more than $35 copayment for uh, people who take insulin monthly. Uh, this is a big deal. Richard, we've had five documented deaths in the past couple of years from people who died trying to ration their insulin. And mm -hmm. insulin is like water for insulin dependent diabetics. And we're going to make insulin be affordable on a monthly basis at no more than $35 out of your pocket a month. Big deal. It imposes, as you said, for the first time ever, an annual out-of-pocket maximum for the Medicare prescription drug benefit. I mentioned that I pay $15,000 a year out-of-pocket for my Medicare Part D oral drug. It will go down to 2000 This is going to help a whole bunch of people. And I have to say me too. Um, mm -hmm. And then we are going to negotiate. For the first time ever since 2003, when the Medicare drug benefit was first enacted, we are going to be able to negotiate directly with the drug companies. Medicare will use its purchasing power for admittedly a small group of drugs, but some of the most expensive drugs, some of the drugs that most badly abuse people with high prices. Uh, and this is critically important uh, because the drug companies have invested hundreds of millions of dollars. They invested heavily to win that prohibition on Medicare negotiating directly with them for lower prices and to keep it. And the fact that we are about to break through that wall and have for the first time ever, the ability of our government to negotiate on our behalf for a subset of the most expensive drugs is a big deal. Uh, so there are many things in this legislation that are very good and very important and that will help people. And uh, we are working our tails off to make sure that it makes it across the finish line with the Build Back Better reconciliation package. And David Mitchell, I want to, you know, I want to express this the right way, right? I, I, I think everything you've described is a very good uh, based, you know, compared to the status quo, 
and be so mild compared to yeah. the magnitude of the problem yeah. and egregiousness of what the drug companies do that they uh they they get the patents to things the government uh partially or entirely developed they bleed us dry for them and and have a body count to go along with it for people who can't afford it then they lobby to make sure our own we can't even negotiate with them as a government for those drugs and now we're taking the first step the yeah. first step, let's take yeah. a handful of expensive drugs and do something about it. Let's cap the out-of-pocket costs. The insulin, which the scientists who developed it gave away the patent for a dollar each, three dollars yeah. total. That, that you know, all these very, very modest... So on the one hand, it's, it's a big improvement. On the other hand, it's so small that I feel it's a moral... I feel two things about it. One, it's a moral challenge for our elected officials at this point. If you can't do this in the yeah. face of a problem of this magnitude, it, you know, it says terrible things, number one. But number two, if you do do this, elected officials, maybe it's one of those like trim tab course corrections where, you know what, you can do it. Now that you've done this, let's yeah. build on it and do more. And, and and I'll just close by saying, and I'm one of those radicals who thinks, like, you know, uh, there's the sky's the limit, nationalize the drug companies, seize the executives' houses and turn them into rehabs for opiate. So it's like there's, there's no attitude uh, more too radical for me in this. But my attitude is I 100% support this, one, because it's an improvement, and two, because maybe it's a little bit of behavioral mod for our elected officials you know, that they can do better than this. But I've ranted as I am wont to do from time to time. So uh, I'll give you the floor. I have to say that um, it is in some ways modest compared to the problem as you defined it at the outset of your ranting. Um, <laughs> we, we need to do more, but Pharma is the most powerful lobby maybe in the world. And we have very narrow margins in the House and the Senate. If we had a couple more votes in the House and a couple more votes in the Senate, we would have had a stronger bill. But we have never been able to break through the barriers that I just listed uh, and take steps to make it better in this country, make the drug pricing system better, make it work better for the people it's designed to serve. And we are taking some critical steps. It's not everything we need, but you and I have been around long enough to know that there are political realities and you have to work with them. Right. Uh, and we are we were not going to let something that would actually move us in the right direction and provide real help to people get away from us. So we're going to grab it, we're going to run with it, and then we're going to keep fighting to make it better. Uh, the That's the way, you know, stuff uh, moves forward, I think. Uh, and if we could get more, we would. Uh, but we're going to take what we've got because there's value in it. I, absolutely. And, you know, I, I, I because I am on the left, I you know, there are these tactic and strategy discussions about major change, which is something I've worked for a lot. But you know what? I cannot see sacrificing the short-term needs of millions of people on a theoretical fight. You know, we, we can hold two ideas in our heads at once, and we can fight for this. And I want to emphasize, David Mitchell, uh, that while you and I, because of our own experience, and especially yours, uh, as a cancer patient, have talked about older people and Medicare. I want to emphasize oh. how much this matters to younger people, to children. One of those insulin deaths you described, I believe, was a 21-year-old man. Yeah. Uh, we have children who, uh, cancer patients and others who need uh, care, whose lives are literally hanging in the balance uh, on a on a law like this, uh, on legislation like this. So maybe we can talk just a little bit about what this means for families, for younger people, and so on. I, this is critically important. You know, we have built a community of patients uh, that has grown to be 360,000 people in the last four mm -hmm. years. Uh, 
Richard, we didn't know if we could organize people around drug pricing, but it turns out you can. And people of all ages, because they are suffering at all ages. Some of the most poignant stories we have are from people in their 20s and 30s who have a chronic disease that requires ongoing medication. They live in fear daily that they will not be able to afford their medication. They make life decisions based on, oh my God, if I lose my job or my insurance, I won't be able to afford the medication I need. Consequently, they decide not to go to school. They decide they can't start a little business. They decide to build their life around making sure that they have their medication instead of maybe doing things that would be incredibly important to them and important to how they live their life, uh, perhaps differently. Um, this problem affects people of all ages. And I'll give you one other specific example. Among the most expensive drugs out there are, are cystic fibrosis drugs. Hmm. Cystic fibrosis tends to affect people who are younger because many people don't make it till when they're older. Um, these drugs, cystic fibrosis drugs, costing $300,000 a year. Absolutely no justification for that price. But this affects not only the children or young people uh, with cystic fibrosis, but the whole family. Uh, and so this is a healthcare problem. This is a kitchen table issue. Uh, and uh, it's one that we have let multinational corporations take control of our lives in ways that we never should have. Uh, and now we're trying to break that power. So what happens next? You said that th this framework, which represents an improvement, certainly over the status quo, you said that this framework has been agreed upon by 50 senators, which means if it's part of a reconciliation bill, a bill, bill back better, it it should pass. Uh, the, the House is likely to sign on to this, right, with a majority. So, um, I mean, maybe this is... My What's grandmother's happening? voice talking about what could go wrong. Oh, uh, so many things could go wrong. <laughs> um, what's happening now is uh, we expect, uh, uh, well, the speaker has said that she wants to advance this legislation. Uh, the Rules Committee is meeting um, today, I think. They may be meeting right now, uh, but uh, meeting and we expect uh, based on the speaker's wishes to see a vote uh, as soon as the next couple of days uh, in the House. And given that this was painfully negotiated uh, to ensure the votes, uh, we expect uh, the drug pricing provisions to pass along with the Build Back Better reconciliation package in the House. Now, it could get hung up on issues that don't have to do with drug pricing uh, in the House. We'll see. And then um, the majority leader, Chuck Schumer, wants a vote on the Build Back Better reconciliation package by November 15th. Maybe we can, maybe we can't. But drug pricing rides with the whole okay. reconciliation package. And so our job is to ensure that the drug pricing provisions uh, remain intact, in and that Build Back Better makes it across the finish line. So the the critical period, besides the House vote, and say there's sometimes a two three day delay before people hear the show, so it may have happened by then. But but the critical uh, juncture points are the House vote, and then uh, the entire package supposedly making it through by November fifteenth. So David Mitchell, I would assume that well, if people are concerned about this issue and everybody should be that uh, they should be spending between now and November 15th, letting their senators and representatives yes. know yes. how much they care about this. Right. Yes. They should pick up the phone and call their elected members of Congress, both senators, their house member and say, get this done now. And as, uh, you know, I, I say this ad nauseum, and I'll continue to say it as a former staffer to a senator, 
that matters. Those calls, those emails matters, especially from matter, especially from constituents. So uh, where can people go to find out uh, more about uh, your organ, your organization? So uh, you can go to patientsforaffordabledrugs.org. It's just like it sounds. Patients, F-O-R, affordabledrugs.org. Uh, another place people can go is medicarenegotiations.org, where we actually have a website that makes it easy for people to send a note to their elected official uh, demanding uh, that this legislation pass. So either place, uh, uh, one is a place to be active. The other is a place to learn more about uh, what we do. Well, I encourage people to go to both sites, and I also encourage people to just hammer their elect their federal elected officials. It matters. It matters. It matters. If you do nothing else this week, political, yep. do that. And uh, David Mitchell, thanks for all your great work and your great advocacy in this area. Um, best of luck with your health, and uh, and thanks for coming on the program. Richard, thanks for having me, and I hope your uh, AMGUS, also known as smoldering myeloma, uh, does not flare up and uh, that you have many, many years without having to deal with an active cancer. Yeah, well, I hope if it does... Take care of yourself. Thank you, I will, and I hope if it does flare up, we pass this goddamn legislation first. You're you're absolutely right. So, all right, David. Thank you for having me. A pleasure, a pleasure.